Hello everyone, welcome to PLC basic training provided by Control Sub Team. I'm Zian Zhang. Before we start our training, I'd like to show you guys the reference. The order of the content and several ideas are directly borrowed from the book Programmable Logic Controllers, an emphasis on design and application by Professor Calvin T. Erickson at Missouri University of Science and Technology. I would like to here give special thanks to him. This slide shows you the outline of our training material. First, I would like to introduce you guys to PLCs. And then, we'll start with basic ladder logic programming. Then, we'll talk about tags and data type in logic controllers. And then, we'll talk about functions like timers and counters, comparison and computation. And last, we will see some real programs that we made in our test bed. Section 1 Introduction to PLCs. So, the first question will be obvious What is PLC? What does PLC stand for? PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controllers. A description to that would be they are workhorses of, pro of modern manufacturing and automations. As you can see in the diagram below, what PLC does is that it takes the measurement from input sensors and somehow transfer it into some kind of actions to output actuators, which are going to actually access the process. And that will further infect your input sensors and therefore generate a loop. This diagram is basically telling you the concept of what PLC does. And there are going to be a more detailed one on the next slides, then we can take a look. Now, let's take a look at this more detailed diagram over here. In this picture, PLC is represented by those blocks over here, which consist of um, processors and several input or output modules. And then, let's take a look at the uh, testbed over here. It is made up of a robot arm a CNC drill, several conveyor systems, and what it does over here is that the parts are transferred, or the parts are transferring on the conveyors. And once a single part has arrived a position called pickup point, then it's going to trigger the proximity sensor over there, which will send out a signal to PLC, telling the PLC that a part has arrived at the, that certain point. And what PLC does over here is that then it's going to output some kind of signal all the way to the robot arms and CNC drills. In, in this case, probably just the robot arms, which going to turn the motors and also extend or retreat the solenoids, which will actually achieve the movement of picking up that certain parts and transfer it all the way from pickup point to CNC drill. And once that part is done, the CNC drill going to trigger some kind of a limited switch telling the PLC that a part has arrived the CNC or a part has been has has been through all the CNC procedures or it's, it's done machining. After that, the PLC is going to send out further output signals to robot arms and CNC drill to tell them to pick up the parts from CNC drill and all the way to parts bins. So now this is a more visualized example of the previous diagram. And what we actually doing over here is at this corner called programming, programming terminal, which basically means most of the time the desk, desktop in our test bed. And we actually do the programming of PLC to help it receive the signal and give the right output based on the signal. And a little bit more information about this PLC is that the initial concept was developed in 1968, which is a really long time ago. However, it is still being widely used in the industry because of several reasons. The first thing is it is really reliable in the industrial environment and it's very easy to maintain. All these are compared to personal computers. And then a really advantage of it is it has a really quick power failure. A restart time for pro, uh, personal computer or PC will be roughly from 5 to 8 seconds. 
However, for PLC, it normally only takes one to three seconds for it to recover from a power failure. And then it has other advantages like it is going to execute everything in a sequential order. Section 2 Basic Ladder Logic Programming. Now, knowing what PLC is and what it does, it is time for us to know a little bit about how to program it. The programming used to trigger PLC is called ladder logic. And as you can see over there on the right, this is a picture I took from our testbed and it's actually part of the program I made. And it, it achieves a function that is gonna read some information from RFID tag using RFID transceivers in our testbed. It has several functions like move a certain signal to a certain destination or some quality uh, some conditional check that whether two signal values are equal or not. We probably will not go through this at the very beginning, but we'll start with something like this. Those are called contacts and the other ones are called coils. We'll talk about them in the later slides really quick. And the ladder logic is called the first and still most popular programming language for PLC. And the quick point over here is that yes, there exists several other ways to program PLC, like functional block and other things. But for our testbed and for our training, we'll just focus on ladder logic programming. Now, let's get into the details about all the basic elements of ladder logic. Another thing I need to mention over here is that all the rest of training going to based on not just ladder logic, but also just focus on Studio 5000 Logics Designer. This is a software designed by Rockwell or Alan Bradley. There are other companies like Siemens, like GE, like um, Medcon that do the same ladder logic programming program. But however, for our testbed, we'll use the specific one, Studio 5000, designed by Rockwell only. So the, all the symbol, what it looks like, gonna be specific for Rockwell software only. And for other softwares like Siemens or GE, they might be slightly different, but the logic and the idea should be similar. So the first element I would like to introduce to you guys is called a normally open contact. This is just like a normal switch we have, which basically means if it is triggered as on, then it will pass its power. And it's considered as on when it is actually closed. So at the normal state, it's open. And the second element is just opposite. It's called normally closed contact. This one passes power only if it is open or only if it's, it's triggered as off. Those two are gonna be mainly used to trigger an output, or in here we call it a coil, which is just represented by this symbol over here. So what it does over here, if any left to right wrong passes power, it is energized, or it is on, or if not, then it will be de-energized. Okay, what is a wrong? Let's go back to the uh, previous slides. All this several lines over here from 0, 1, 2, 3 are called wrong because this is going to be run 0, 1, run 2, run 3. And because of the pattern over here, actually, this is why we call this a ladder logic because it really looks like a ladder. And now let's take a really quick example. So I have two contact over here. The first one is called Wudong. The second one is called Money. And the first one is normally open. The other one is normally closed. And I have output or coil called Happy. So what I try to show over here is that if Wudong is on, or which I will try to say I have Wudong, 
and money is off, which means I don't need to pay for it. What I'll trigger is happy. Why not? Free Wudo. However, one thing you need to mention over here is that those are contact, which works exactly like switches in our real life. If just for a millisecond that that, that udon is off or the or it's not it's not closed, then the output coil gonna be de-energized for that one millisecond. You see, so in order to have to have it keep open for output to keep open for a relatively long and steady time, normally we do not use contact directly. But this is just pretty much like the contact and light bulb circuits that the, the switch just have to be remain closed steady steadily <laughs> the next two elements we're going to talk about are called latch oil and unlatch coil those are kind of in pairs just like normal open and normal close contacts so what a latch coil does is that if any run path passes power it is generalized and remain generalized even when no run path passes and represented by an L in the middle of the coil and the unlatched coil is just the opposite is that if any run path passes power it is de-energized and remain de-energized even when no run path passes and represented by the U over here so this sort of help us to solve the problem in the previous slides that once I have a normally open contact, I need to remain contact all the time. Let's take a look at this example over here. So it's pretty much like an update version of the previous one. Instead of just using one coil over here, now I have two. As we can see over here, if, if Udon is triggered on and money is keep off, then happy will be latched. It means even if Udon now is turned all the way to off or I turn money on, I'll still remain in happy way. And the unlatch just means that I will unlatch set. Now let's take a look at the other example. This one has the, has the same elements as the previous one, but the only thing it does is that instead of putting the latch and unlatch coil in series, they're in parallel right now. And think about this. Is there going to be any difference in these two circuits? Well, generally speaking, there's not. <laughs> Let's cut this example into half from here. The left part is sort of like the conditional part where like all those conditional all those conditions are satisfied then the right part gonna be executed no matter what it it is on the right part however in reality probably it will be better to put it in parallel way because in logic you would like to trigger them at the same time instead of triggering one after another or the opposite way if you design for special that one is triggered before the other will keep it in the as the top one so just think about the difference over here and there's many ways you can orient your output coils and you need to pick the right one the, the desired one Now, let's take a look at another example, a more professional example. So now I have some kind of expression over here that y equals to a and b and c not, or d or e not. So how am I going to do this in the letter logic? It's shown below. So like I said, we cut this one into half where the rest where the left, I'm sorry, is going to be the conditionals and the right going to be our light bulb over here. So for the C not thing, we use the normal closed contact, which means when it is 
off, it actually passes power, or the output is actually going to be on. And we keep A, B as normal open, and just add another round. Par Sorry, it's not called a round. In this case, it's called a branch. We add another branch parallel to this A, B, and C naught, which represents OR D, and add another E naught over here, branch parallel to the previous two branches. And this should be relative straightforward to tell you that what's going to be our conditions to energize Y. If A is closed, B is closed, C is not closed, we energize Y, which represents A is on, B is on, C is not on, or C is off, then Y is on. Or the branches can always go like the other way. Let's think about the uh, the power trans tra the power transferring from one point to the other. It can go this way, or down to another branch, or another one. So in the second branch, it's just going to be D. If D is on, then Y is on. In the in the last one, it's going to be if E is off, actually, then Y will be on, which is exactly at this E naught over here. Okay. Let's see another example over here. What is special about this one is that actually in ladder logic, an output coil can be also used as somehow a contact over here. See this Y over here and Y over here. Think about what's, what this ladder logic going to do. Let's see if at the very beginning that A, B, is on, triggered on, and C is off, which means just as over here, Y will be generalized. Once Y is gen energized, I'm sorry, once I is energized, or one is Y is on, this contact over here will remain on. And this tells you that there will always be power transferring here through the lower branch to Y, which will keep Y on all the time. Think about this. Basically, what this led logic does is that once this condition this condition is satisfied just once, and then the old output gonna energize itself and remain energized itself all the time. This is a little bit similar like the latch coil we just learned, right? However, the thing with this one is, in the latch coil, I can always use just latch over there, and in the later on, I can easily use the unlatch coil to unlatch what I have just latched. However, in here, there's actually no way I can shut Y down. Think about this. In order to shut Y down, what I need actually need to do is I need to add somehow another con control contact over here. It doesn't matter if it's a normally on, normally open, or not normally close one, but somehow we definitely need to add some kind of a condition over here in order to actually shut down Y. Because there's no way we're gonna like to just turn something on and never turn it off, right? Okay, another thing is over here that do not repeat normal output coils or latch or unlatch, which means if I have a Y over here, what I really want to do is do something like this, put all my conditions that's going to trigger Y in the one run. The, doesn't matter how many branches you have, you have, have all the way down to here, so as many branches as you need, but do not repeat Y, which means in the rest part of your program, we shouldn't find another Y as output coil. This will definitely help you to have a better logic or a clear, more clear logic and it's easy for others to understand and read. The second thing is use latch coil and unlatch coil together. This is a way to help you keep reminding that you have actually latched something, that something is is being kept on and you, you would like to add a off condition to it just in case you might forget sometimes. So always use latch coil and unlatch coil together. Whenever you latch something on, 
think about it and and think about what's going to be the unlatch condition and put it right after it okay now the last part about this section we're going to see a really strange example over here as we can see it looks a little bit complicated than previous one but still it's just made up three basic elements a normally open and a normally uh, close contact and a coil over here so let's see what's going to happen what we can do to trigger this Y so this is not like a commonly used branches over here but we can still read a little bit that if A is on B is on C is off this branch is going to pass power to Y and definitely Y will be on which is going to be same as over here and if A is on D is on and E is on for sure Y will be on it's pretty much like just this A put it in series with a parallel structure B, C naught or D and E right so this is pretty obvious and the thing causing a problem over here is this F contact over here think about it if F is on and E is on well we got path over here that's gonna transfer the power no problem Y will be energized but what if F is on D is on B is on C is not on or C is off then we can see over here that we have another path right which also will gives all the way to Y this brings us back to the comparison between ladder logic and the circuits it, it is true that in some way this ladder logic looks very much like a circuit where you have switches and once switches is once switches is um, closed or, or not closed for a normally op uh, normally closed one you got power passed through it and you can gen you can light a bulb or bulb or something however what's the difference over here is that in ladder logic you can never go back like in this direction so even though in this case F is on D is on B is on C is, is off there's no way you're gonna trigger this Y over here because simply the logic won't go reverse in a direct, different direction it will always go from left to right and from top to bottom so it always go like this and the same time over here and over there uh, to be more to be clarified when I say from from top to bottom it doesn't mean that this kind of action is not allowed no it just means that it actually means that it executes from wrong zero to wrong one this kind of top to bottom thing so we'll always run wrong zero first and then wrong one so just that you know that and in this example what we should learn from it is that there's no way we're gonna actually active Y by uh, triggering F D B and now C and actually if you take a better look at this one the diagram over here is not very clear well to be honest this is just a made up uh, picture uh, I did this just to tell you guys the idea that this kind of from right to left direction won't work in ladder logic and actually when you actually programming this ladder logic in the software the software itself won't allow you to connect make such kind of connection over here so if you create create a branch over here from this starting point you either can go with here or all the way to there there's no way you can just connect somewhere in the between so I have to uh, modify the, the picture a little bit to get this one but at least you guys get idea about this one okay now let's move to section 3 tags and data type so tags are somehow like variables in other program language you learn that you need to define something yourself and in order to achieve whatever you want right and the variables over here are called tags or user defined tags actually there are different 
There are other types of tags, like input tags, output tags, we can talk about later. But for this first part, we'll just talk about those variables. And there are certain data type according to it. And I'll show you four really quick, like what's a bool. Bool is just a one bit boolean. It only takes one bit space and it's just going to be a really easy zero one thing. So it's going to be either off or on. That's what it does. So if you create a tag, which with a bool data type, all you can have is two, st two states from that tag. Either it's on or it's off. And the second one is called sint. Well, this is a this is a different data type. Now it can actually, it is a one byte integer, which goes all the way from minus 128 to 127. If you create a tag with a data type of sint, what you can do is that you can store integer to it with a range of 256 numbers. And now another two will be called counters and timers. If you pay close attention to the outline, they will be discussed after this section. And we'll talk more later. So there are many ways you can define your tags and also you can name your tags basically whatever you want just with several rules. The first one is the first character of your tag cannot be a digit. And second, there cannot be two more underlines continuously. And the third one is you cannot use underline as a last character. Okay, those three rules are like the bottom limit that you can you can definitely define as, as long as you you follow those rules you can define whatever text you want you can define your text name whatever you want however it is strongly recommended that you define your tag with certain kind of meaning or process over there let's go back to take a good example over here is that what we did over here the tags we are using we, we just learned, or the user-defined tags are this one, as you can see, or this two, or this this two. And as you can see, the first part, R6Z, is pretty much stands for RFID transceiver number six. And this program is modified by me, so my uh, name, ZN, over there. And then the clear mode tells you that what this function is called, this overall project is, for in, is within a clear mode where basically what it does is, is clear all the contact on, in the tag. And then this RZ6 is still the same meaning. Read means the read procedure is, is going to achieve and read start means the starting point of that. All of this kind of thing help other people to understand your logic and to keep your logic more organized. And a really bad example over here is this one. You should never name something like Udong, money, or happy. But it's just an example, right? So forgive me about that. <laughs> okay, now let's move on to the next slide. Okay, um, as you can see in the program we made, I just show you really quick. There are some really long name tags over there with with similar this kind of structure over here. Those are called input output tags. That's a totally different tag as user defined tags. This comes with the system. It's pretty much like whenever you have an input or output sensor, they gonna somehow generate tags automatically for you. This, this Those tags come from the hardware side, which you just cannot change the name because they're defining a certain way that you can read some kind of information some kind of information out of their names. Now let's take a look at this first one. So this first one is this weird name. Probably the only thing that really makes sense is the busy one. And what I can tell you is that if you take a look at this tag, the data type with this tag is a bool, which means it has only zero or one. 
which is off or on, right? And think about this dot bz. It makes sense that what this text actually do is that it tells you that something is busy or not. That's why this this bool data type comes with this tag. And what we can also read from this one is at the very beginning of this part, this RFID underline N056 is actually the RFID interface module that this is a software that that connected to PLC. And after that, this Another thing I need to mention over here that is that this module is actually a dual channel one, which has means it has two channels, and that explains why over here you see we have to specify either it's channel zero or channel one. So channel zero basically referring to one RFID transceiver, and channel one referring to another RFID transceiver. And in our test bed, we call the first one RFID number five, and the other one is RFID number six. And as you can see, this channel zero representing RFID transceiver number five physically, that you can actually find the RFID transceiver that that go with this tag. And this I over here tells you that it's a digital input signal. So that's why it only has the zero and one data. So overall, what this 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 is an input tag tells you is that this is an input tag that goes with this certain RFID interference modulus which representing transceiver 5 and it's the input one it, it tells you that whether that transceiver number 5 right now is busy or not okay let's take a look at another one now this one it has a similar format the first thing we can tell for sure is that okay the data type is different this is a synth which means this data or the, I'm sorry this tag is used to store integers and it comes from the same interference module right which means it's also related to some kind of RFID thing however instead of channel 0 now it's channel 1 which like I talked just previously that now this one is actually referring to uh, trans transceiver number 6 physically okay and instead of a digital input, this is output signal. Which means this tag is used to actually send out some signal from PLC to RFID transceiver. So this dot data 10 over here is just uh, one, one part of it. The, the RFID transceiver has a total of 112 tags space I would say tag bats we can use and this is data 10 is the 11th of it because it goes from 0 to 111 so all those 112 tags are sent which are used to store integers and this is how you, you actually write to an RFID tag so whatever you put in this tag in, in this this output digital output tag it's going to actually be written to the RFID tag with some other functions so but that's this is how you do that this is what this tag tells you and I think that's everything you need to know from tags and data type <clears throat> now let's see section 4 timers and counters so Let's first take a look at the timer. For the first example, we're going to look at this very specific type of timer called TON or on delay timer. So, an on delay timer is a kind of timer that when the input is on, the accumulator is counted up once every each millisecond. And when the accumulator equals to the preset value, the timer is timed out and the dot dn bit going to be triggered to be on and another thing we need to take consider is that if the timer input turns off during that interval timing interval the accu uh, accumulator will automatically set to zero 
and until the input turns on, it will it will redo everything. So now let's um, take a look at the uh, graphs on the right hand side. So that TON represents that on delay timer over there, and the the timer preset accumulate tells you whatever the first one is what you call this timer and for here you name it as TIMER timer 1 or you can name it something else it's up to you user defined the preset is the value we just talked about remember the newness over here is millisecond so 2000 actually means 2 second and the accumulate will actually show you the current value like if uh, if it's 1.5 milliseconds or uh, what's the time right now and um, that en over there shows that the timer is enabled that it's um, powered through right to left and that dn over there is not connected to anything because it's, it's a bit that used to only be set on after the timer is done okay and the, the graph next uh, below it is the uh, pro pro um, property ta table of the timer. And we can see we can here we can change the name of the timer and add some description to it, like um, what is ti this timer used for and why we set that preset value to that certain kind of time. And um, also um, the timer, as we talked previously, is a certain type of um, data type. So this timer one is also considering as a user defined tag, but just a very different type of it. It's a timer. And now let's take a example over here. Okay. So we got this two wrong um, letter logic over here. And our input condition is simply a always open switch called A. And then A is connect to our um, on delay timer, TO1, we call timer 1, which has a preset of 2 seconds or 2000 milliseconds. And what's going to happen over here is that first we need to trigger A on, and once A is on, the timer is going to keep counting until it's done or until after 2 seconds. Then the timer 1.dn going to consider it as on. That will trigger Y over here. And as you can see over here, like we talked previously, that if A is off during that two seconds, then everything goes back to zero. Nothing gonna happen at all. So what you have to make sure using a TUN timer over here is that you have to make sure that your input gonna stay on for a relatively long time. All, all you need to do is that you want something to happen delay that two times after. It is not really a good function or a good um, element you like to use if you want to actually um, accumulate some kind of time. However, we got other types of timer that can achieve that kind of function. As we can see over here, the first one is called the TO, the other one is called the TOF or off delay timer. This actually does the opposite as the um, on delay timer, which means it's only um, uh, it's only uh, accumulated if your condition input is, is off. Okay, so that won't help with what we just said. However, the other one, we call it um, retentive on delay timer. That one will do that no matter no matter if the, the, the input you have is continuous or not, it's going to keep accumulating. Actually, it can, it can change rapidly from on to off or on to off and our, uh, this RTO timer going to do is that it will remember each time that it's on and accumulate a certain really small amount of time in milliseconds and all the way until it's 2000 milliseconds and then it's going to trigger the dot DM bit. And another thing we'd like to talk over here is that besides you have this like a uh, timer one dot dn, which represents the that the timer is considered as done. You can also use some function like timer one dot acc, which represents the accumulated number. That will returns you the value, a certain integer that's um, that tell you how what's what's the current value of your timer, and 
it, it might not be very useful for a timer, but as we can see later, that this might be helpful in a counter. And so now let's move on to another one, which is relatively similar to timer, but it's called um, counter. So the counter works very similarly as the uh, timer. And um, what that does is that um, instead of counting in uh, one milliseconds, it counts every time that your input signal changes. So we have two, actually two kinds of uh, counter. The, the one is called the first one is called up counter. The second one is called down down counter. So they so for for one um, so for every off to on transist trans transition of the counter input. So you have to remember this one specifically. It's from off to on, and for every one of those, your accumulator gonna either increase or decrease by one. And that's the difference between the up counter and the down counter. And you can see they just look like the graph on the right, with the CTU represents count up and the CTD represents count down. And you can also name it whatever you want. So you definitely won't want to mess them up. So you can na name them at the same name, both as counter one, but here is just an example. And as you can see, they look really like the, the, the timer. And if your preset is satisfied, the dot dm bet gonna be triggered, and if you want to um, modify the description or the name of this user defined tag, we can always look at into the property table, and that's what you got over there at the uh, right corner. An example we have over here <coughs> is that this um, input condition is called a, and once it's switched from off to on, remember that condition has to be from off to on. We're gonna count. For this one, it's a uh, uh, count up counter, so we're gonna count up one. So the accumulated number, as actually, you can see through PLC, is gonna change from zero to one. And as you keep doing this one all the way until it's ten, that dot dn bit gonna trigger. And the difference between the counter and the timer is that for a timer, for just a commonly used timer, if input A is somehow off or uh, cl or not not close anymore. The counter will. Uh, the, I'm sorry. The timer will gonna refresh itself automatically. However, for here, the counter you actually have to manually set the reset over there. That's what that that res over here represents. So you have to actually set up some kind of a condition to reset your counter. Otherwise, it's gonna stay there. The, the after its preset value is set aside. So here, I simply do that by. Um, by put a dot d on there. So basically, what it did it is that once it's set as ten, it goes to zero again. So it not it's probably not what you really want to do in your not letter logic, but at least it show you the idea about what it does. There are also other types of um, counters that you can use. Some of like um, um, some of use or like uh, you can combine two counters and and. And get a combination of called a mixed counter or a up and down counter, which can count up and down. So whenever, uh, whenever uh, input is um, changed from off to on, you you increase one, and if change from on to off, you decrease one. So those are all can be achieved by a combination of these two counters actually. But uh, we don't have the time to introduce all this today. But there's something you can think about it, and then this is basically how you use both timers and counters. Okay, now for the very last part of our training, we're gonna take a look at the program we wrote to for the RFID transference number six. And uh, the program is used to actually read from a certain tag that represents in front of RFID transceiver six and then gonna determine whether to write or modify something we want to the RFID tag. Okay, so the overall program is made up of uh, in total of 10 rounds all the way from round zero to round nine. And we're gonna read through it line by line and try to explain the overall logic and some uh, knowledge we just learned. Okay, so let's start with the uh, first 
or I'm sorry, the zero ROM. Okay, so as you can see, the elements which should be um, relative familiar, just with um, one thing that we're now 100% sure is this MOV, or we call move function or move block. This element is um, relative straightforward, as you can see, it's called move, and what it does is it moves whatever here in the source to a certain kind of destiny or destination. So what value you have over here, they're going to just be copied to your destination value. Okay, and uh, so let's start by looking at the overall structure of this first round zero. So what you have is you have a cut all the way from here. All, all the way on your left is those inputs or your conditions, I would call. And on your right is going to be whatever the results you want this to achieve. So if the right hand part is, is satisfied, you're going to want to do something on the right side. Or everything, I'm sorry, instead of something, but everything. on the, You're going to achieve everything on your right. Okay, now let's take a look. What you have for input is that if your first several switch, they're all switches um, or contacts over here, um, three of them are normally closed, two of them are normally uh, open, so if those two are uh, closed and those three are open, you would like your um, right hand side to be achieved. Okay, now the mode auto over here is a uh, user defined tag we define, and it is used for um, it, it, it means that the mode right now of our overall testbed is transferred to auto and this one is actually related to the button that's on our HMI, uh, HMI screen so once the button mode auto is hit, mode auto should be turned on and it will stay on so in most of cases mode on should be a, a, a closed contact and that clear mode over here basically means that we have another situation where we like to, uh, for testing purpose, we would like to erase whatever we have in our current tags. So we, on that condition, we use clear mode. And here, what basically means that if the clear mode is not on, which means we are not under clear mode, we would like to proceed all this. And the next one, as you can see over here, is really complicated and it's in blue. So. If you remember, this is not a user defined tag. This is a digital input uh, uh, tag. Take a look at this I over here. I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but this I represents, if you remember, that it represents digital input. So this is the um, tag present user tag related to the uh, RFID transceiver 6. And what it does is that it um, turns on once it the RFID transceiver sends a tag in front of it. So that's what it does. And now that dot busy, dot busy thing is the one we used as example, which pretty means tell you whether the transceiver right now itself is busy or not. And it will only be functional if it's not busy. And now that R R6Z read is a user defined tag, and it's going to be the similar one, similar one over here. And basically, what I want to do if, if you're thinking about this is that all if all the first four inputs are satisfied, and this one at the very beginning, this should be uh, closed, or th th this should be this should be off, which means it will be energized, and then it will it will um, proceed all these functions and also trigger this one itself, make this tag latched, and this one gonna become on, which means you're gonna shut off everything and make sure this wrong zero gonna just be execute once as a purpose all the way until I unlatch this R6Z read tag so that's why I put those two using in pairs this one and this one they are exactly the same one but in different um, contact one as input the other one's output okay and once all our input is satisfied what we want is that we move 0, 0, 0, and 10 to certain places. Those are, as you can see, um, a RFID output tag. The first one is related to comment. The second one is data 0. The third one is address. And the fourth one is length. 
So here I need to tell you some um, basic information about how RFID works. Basically, that's that uh, if I want to do some certain con kind of command to RFID transceiver, I need to set several things to the transceiver output and send them to the transceiver to from the PLC side to make the transceiver work. So, and what I need to define to achieve a reading function over here is that I need to set command to four. Number f the value four is defined as um, reading function, and I need to keep the first data that of my attack to be zero all the time. So that's why I said this output to be zero and also I need to define which starting point I would like to read and how long I would like to read that's what those address and then for so for here basically what I define is that I'm not going to do anything I set command to zero and uh, I'm gonna make sure that data zero is zero I'm gonna I'm gonna try to set address at zero and read the length of 10 so those are like preset um, movement before I actually change the function um, and uh, after all this is done I latch another tag called read start and this read start is all the way followed over here as you can see those two so basically what it means is only if all these are satisfied and this is gonna be executed just once remember this two tags we have and then we're gonna trigger next step which is this two at the same time and once those are executed once, this tag gonna be unlatched, which means all this will only be executed once every reading process. So that's what we did over here. Where you should latch and using those as um, contact over here and re and unlatch it. And we're gonna see really similar structure later on for this one. But now let's take a look over here. This is a comparison function, and this is simply echo. So if your source A and B are echo, then it's gonna be energized. And it doesn't matter the order of A and B, you can always flip, flip them over. So, what over here is that I want to double check if I have already sent um, command to be zero you look the difference over here this is the uh, output which means this is how I sent data from PLC to RFID and this is the input tag this is where I read from P uh, from I'm sorry from transceiver to PLC so this two combined make sure that what I just did I send the signal over there to transceiver to set command to zero it's doing it correctly so I can get a command zero of zero from uh, from the transceiver okay so once that makes sure now I'm actually going to start the reading process and that's where I'm going to move that number four which like I said it's uh, representing the reading function of the transceiver actually to the command byte and at the same time I want to make sure that my um, my overall process is going to just be executed once that's really important I don't, I don't want to overread it or do it a lot of time which is really unnecessary so um, all this is just gonna happen because because I know if the reading is happening at, at that certain time the transceiver gonna be busy which means this dot busy gonna be on for a really really short time because the transceiver reads and writes really fast so at this really short time this this second run gonna be um, those inputs are gonna be true or on and then I can follow to the next step Okay, now let's look at the same same structure over here. We have the uh, latch in progress. You see this one as an input, and then unlatch it immediately after that step to make sure all this only run once. Okay, and now it's the same thing. I need to check that uh, whether I did that correctly. So if that input is four or not, if it's four, then I know that I have already uh, successfully made the command to four or it also means that I have achieved reading so I'm, it's the time where I'm going to get my results so I call the tag read results and from here what I want to do is that I need to use the input tag where that's where I drag um, data out from transceiver or out from the tag actually and move it all the way to PLC 
these are source, those are um, input tags. However, the destination are my user-defined tags. Those tags are what I use to define my uh, reading results. So one is in uh, data 8, the other one is data 9, and uh, one is called um, current part number, the other one is called process number. Okay, and after all this, it's the gonna be our next step to um, do some judgment. So it's called a um, process step. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit confusing over here because you have so many tags, and I'm trying to keep them all in constant and to make sense. But sometimes it's hard, but um, that's that's what I call it, um, process tag. And then what I want to do is over here. The logic is, if I if I read a part, uh, the the current part number is is not zero. It's um, zero means it's empty. If it's something else like one or two or three, I know that it's um, a part that's already been assigned. If someone called it part one, part two, or part three. Then I don't want to do anything to it. However, it's, if it's empty tag the uh, current part number is zero. I would like to write actually to that empty tag to assign it to a part number, whatever I want. So that's what basically what I did over here. And all this um, parallel, this two logic over here, is a loop. What it basically does is that it um, generates number for, as a format of one, two, three, one, two, three. So this is order what I want to to assign my parts. So what, whenever I run this program once, all the way from zero to um, round zero to round nine, the number gonna add up to one. So it starts from one. So the first time I run this one, it's gonna write a number one to the empty tag. The second time I run it, it's gonna run the two, and then the three, and then one and two and three. So we don't need to. If you're interested, you can take a look at this one. But um, we don't need to look really in into depth with this one, but that's what those four blocks over here achieved. Also, um, uh, also um, with the assist of this tag over here called set part type. After this process, I would like to uh, do a very similar thing as you can see over here. Those are um, relative, s is, uh, relative uh, similar as our round zero, where's the preset, preset um, uh, outputs that I would like to move certain values or things to uh, my address, my length, my uh, command, and, uh, and the data place. And this is, uh, the only difference over here is that instead of data zero, I'm using data eight. That's the place where I want to put the number to write to instead of reading it. So that's the difference over here. And now uh, check my uh, input again to see whether I have set it to zero. And if that's correct, I'll set a 14 over here which this 14 command actually means write. Remember four is read and 14 is write. You have all kinds of number, I think all the way to 32. There are like more than 30 times, um, or at least 20 different commands. And you can always look them up at, um, uh, at the RFID menu uh, provided for our test bed. And after that is um, done, it's the same um, pattern over here. I, I go to the write in progress, what it does over here is that it makes sure that um, my command has been executed, that is uh, 14 right now. And what I did at the very last is that now I, I check actually whether I have um, successfully read it or not, uh, written to the tag or not. So what it does is basically it reads again. So think about this, the logic is, is when the tag represents, I first read it. If it's uh, part one, two, or three, or anything that's not a zero, I let it go. I do not do anything. If it's a zero, okay, now I need to do something else. I need to uh, write to it. Not only to write to it, but I also need to check that to make sure I have write the correct number to it, the number I wanted to it. So after just simply read it and write it, I need to read again. and. That's why I need to um, basically repeat all the process before again. That set it to four and everything else to read again. And this time, what I want to do is then make sure that this is not equal to zero anymore. If that is true, 
okay then I, I call it the write pass which means I've finished all the writing process and now an uh, empty tag of zero has already been changed to whatever I wanted so it's not a zero anymore however we we'll always add another one over here that if it's still zero take a look we unlatch this exactly same tag and goes all the way to assign where is it let's take a look it's over here so this is somehow kind of a loop that we we created in our light logic that if something happens at the very end that's the thing and we can always go back to the step where um, we just start the writing process and do it all the way again to make sure that we write something to that empty tag and that's the uh, really brief introduction of the overall logic and we would always like to um, introduce more if you are interested and this is the uh, end of the training material and thank you for your time